think the sutta just now. Ah, yes. Why didn't the Buddha go and teach Alara in where wherever he was reborn? Aha. <laughs> and uh, yeah. the other question is, uh, yeah. must we have the jhana at least the first jhana to be a sotapan? They are yeah. they are people who has the view that it is not necessary to have the first jhana yeah. to attain the sotapan. Mm. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so uh, the first one, why didn't the Buddha go and teach? Alara Kalama, where he was? That's a good question. Uh, and uh, there's many possible reasons for that. One is that he was reborn in a realm that was beyond the scope where you can teach someone. So let's say that Alara Kalama had been reborn in a realm that corresponded to his attainment. If it is attainment really was the uh, plane of nothingness, uh, it means that this plane is so high you can't really communicate with people in that plane. Uh, yeah, you are beyond communication, you are kind of gone completely within yourself uh, and there's no communication possible at that point. Uh, so that is one possibility. Uh, m that's maybe the most likely one. I, there are other possibilities as well, but they are a bit more speculative and I don't really want to speculate unless I have some more information available to me. Uh, uh, regarding the other question you have about whether what kind of samadhi you need to, for stream entry and this is uh, really the answer to that is that uh, one of the most important places in the sutta that it talks about these things it talks about the uh, progress of the meditate path of meditation and it always says that the uh, the thing which comes before it is this what I call the dependent liberation sequence uh, and in that dependent li liberation sequence it said samadhi is the cause or the upanisa for yata bhuta nanadasana. Uh, yeah, yata bhuta nanadasana means seeing things according to reality. Uh, and stream entry is, a, is an example of that. When you become a stream entry, you see things according to reality. So the cause for seeing things according to reality, the cause for stream entry is samadhi. Uh, what is samadhi? The most important type of samadhi in the suttas is jhanas. If you read the suttas, jhanas pop up on every other page. You see the, you see the jhanas everywhere. Huh? It's very, very, you know, when the Buddha talks about samadhi, that's generally what he uh, means. So from that, even though it is not absolute kind of, you know, it is not kind of a law of the universe that you necessarily have to have jhanas, uh, it appears from that 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 is the most plausible, most likely pathway, yeah, jhanas, then stream entry. Yeah. But whether it's absolutely necessary or not is a, is a kind of a, uh, it's an academic thing, it's very hard to, to pin down. But the main point here, I think this is a point that people often forget, is that uh, the reason why people ask this question is very often because they want to know, do I have to do jhanas or not, yeah? They want to know and they want to be able to, well, if, if you don't have to do it, uh, if it is possible to become stream entry without, then I can opt out of the jhanas. And that is the wrong conclusion. Uh, yeah? that's, that's the wrong way of thinking about the path. Uh, the path has eight factors and what you do is you practice the path. Uh, and if you haven't got to stream entry yet, you don't stop the path at factor seven. You keep on practicing and practicing and practicing. If you reach stream entry before you get to jhanas, great. Uh, but if you don't, you don't deliberately skip the jhanas because it may block you from actually getting there. Uh, so you just practice the whole path as it is, uh, and then somewhere on the way as you do that, uh, stream entry happens to you. It may happen before jhana, but if it doesn't, please continue practicing, otherwise uh, you are kind of uh, b being very silly, and you, <laughs> you, won't get any, you won't actually achieve the real purpose of the path as a consequence. Uh. So it's a bit of a red herring, I don't really, I think the question is a bit uh, unfortunate, and I don't really, uh, I, I'm, I think that, yeah, I think it's not really uh, the right way of thinking about things, to be honest with you. Uh, does that make sense? Am I m making sense? Yeah? Okay, <laughs> okay, very good. You're allowed to say, you don't make any sense whatsoever, that's okay to say that, yeah? <laughs> and I'll, I will just try again and see what I can do. <laughs> okay. Ah, oh, okay, yes, I remember, that's from yesterday. Okay, good. Uh, <laughs> yeah, please, if you... Yeah, yeah yes, I'm, I'm just repeating the same question again. Please, uh, yeah. Um, yesterday you mentioned about the idea about self, uh, non-self, uh, anatta, and then uh, on the other flip side, uh, we're talking about Patika Samupada, where yeah. you talk about, you know, transmigration of lives from one uh, to the next. Yeah. So these are on opposite sides. So how do you actually reconcile the two? Okay. Good, uh, thank you for, for your patience <laughs> and for uh, waiting because uh, 
Uh, it's, yeah, that's, that's very good. So I'll, I'll talk about that. Uh, I didn't actually have that in mind. If, I, if you hadn't come up, I probably still would have talked about it uh, because I was uh, kind of expecting that. Uh. So, um, the, uh, that question is, uh, comes, arises very often because we assume that uh, if there is going to be rebirth, we assume that there must be something which goes across. Uh, yeah? This is kind of the assumption. It's a very common assumption, I think. And this is one of the reasons why dependent origination is so hard to understand, precisely because there's nothing actually that goes across. Uh, at the same time, you have this process of rebirth. And I think the best way of understanding it is just to look at the present life. Don't forget about rebirth for a moment. and Look at the present life. And what is happening in this life from day to day, from moment to moment, from minute to minute, uh, is actually exactly the same thing that happens in the process of rebirth. Uh, yeah, so if you look at your mind now, uh, you won't really see any essence in there. There's nothing permanent in there. If you ask a psychologist or a philosopher or whatever, if there is any essence to a human being, they will all deny that. They will, there's nothing there that really can be considered permanent. Yeah, the more deeply you look at your mind right now, there's nothing that goes across. And yet, uh, we, you know, yet you exist from moment to moment, yeah? There is a, a continuity there. You, you carry on from one uh, minute to the next one, from one hour to the next one, from one hour to one year to the next one. And that is very similar to the process of dependent origination. There is a kind of continuity, but there's also no essence that kind of holds the thing together. It's exactly the same thing when you get reborn. The only difference when you get reborn is that the body, you lay down the body, you take up another body, but the mind uh, f goes exactly the same, same way as it does in this life. Uh, the mind continues from one to the next one. Uh, there is a causal sequence. If you remember your past life, you will recognize that as you. You will say, oh, there I was in the past life. Uh, just as you, your memory now, when you were a child, you will say that was me when I was a child. Uh, and there is a relationship between who you were 20, 30, 40 years ago uh, to what you are now, but there's no identity here. This is the difference. So uh, continuity, uh, while there is also uh, continuity, but also no uh, um, identity in there. One way of looking at this is to think about a river. Uh, when you see a river uh, moving, you stand at one point and you look at the river at that particular point, uh, you know that any one moment to the next one will not be the same water molecules, there will be different water that actually is in, in that river from one to the next one. Yeah? It is not, ident it is not, not, not identical. But uh, if you look at the shape of the river, uh, the shape tends to stay the same over long periods of time. It only changes slowly because the shape depends on the volume of water, depends on the rocks in the bottom of the river. So the shape is the same, although the, identity, the water is not identical to what it was last moment. Uh, the shape changes slowly, so when there is a season with low rainfall, the water may go down, the shape of the river changes. Uh, uh, have a big rainfall, the r river swells up again, it becomes broader and wider or whatever. Uh, and in exactly the same way, uh, you're you, there's no identity in you going from moment to moment, uh, but, but the general shape of your personality uh, will have a certain shape, uh, and that will tend to carry along in a certain way. Uh. Yeah, so if you just bring it back to who you are in this life, uh, look at how you change in this life and uh, your similarities uh, of personality in this life, it's exactly the same thing that happens uh, when you go from one life to the next one. Uh, yeah? Same principle. Uh. Does that make sense? Uh? Um, it's like saying, uh, yeah. Half full and empty. No, I think about this half full. Yeah. Now you're <laughs> yeah. Yeah. There is connection. That's the whole point. Yeah. What I'm saying is that there is no identity, but there is connection. It's just like in this life, there's also connection. Yeah. So in this life there is connection. So if you think about who you were 20 years ago, the kind of the effects on your life 20 years ago, they affect you still now. 
you know, if you, if you had some happy experience 20 years, you still remember the happy experience. It still affects you right now. Eh? So the things in your life always affect you over long periods of time. Eh? So exactly the same thing from one life to the next one. That the, the stream of consciousness is there. The things, the seeds that were laid down in that stream of consciousness, uh, they have an effect a long time later on. Uh. It's like, um, uh, think about it this way. Uh, you know, one of the ways of looking at karma that I always like, we very often we, t we think about karma as some kind of magical thing. You, you do one thing in this life and then in your next life you get a big, nice new car or something like that. Yeah? This is a kind of common way of looking at karma. Yeah? And, but actually it's not a very useful way of thinking about karma. A far better way is to think about the karma that ripens in the here and now, in this very life. Uh, so if you do an act of kindness, uh, how do you feel about yourself? Usually you feel good about yourself, yeah? You do an act of kindness and we say something nice, it comes from your heart, yeah? Or you do an act of generosity coming from your heart and you feel good, you feel uplifted because you know you've done something kind. And uh, that, if so, Kama is really this accumulation of all these moments of kindness, uh, building up, building up, building up, uh, not doing the bad things that drag you down. Uh, and in this way you're making your mind a more beautiful, a lighter, brighter, more energetic, more mindful place, uh, because you are building it up with all these good moments of, uh, of, of acting in the right way. Uh. So when you die, because you have built up a mind that is, is very bright and beautiful, that mind is already at a certain level, it has certain qualities, certain habits. Uh. Those habits won't, doesn't sto don't stop just because you die. Uh. Those habits, you carry them with you. This is what we mean by continuity. It's like the habit of the river. The river has a habit, has a certain shape. Uh. In the same way, uh, you carry on with the same shape. When you die, the mind has given a certain shape, that shape carries on. So if you create a bright and beautiful mind in this life, that is what you take with you into the future. That's why you get reborn in a good destination. That's why you feel happy in the future life. You are, in a sense, connected with your past actions because that happiness has arisen because of how you acted in this life. You see the connection between how you feel about yourself now and your past actions is always going to be there huh? in this way. Huh? So there is a connection there, just like there is a connection in your mind in this life. Huh? You feel good about yourself or bad about yourself depending on what you did 10 years ago, 20 years ago, 5 years ago, yesterday, in exactly the same way it carries on like that in the future. There's no identity. Nothing actually goes across apart from the, uh, the imprints on the stream of consciousness uh, that carries on in this way. Huh? Yes? <laughs> Coming back to the same topic again, um, <laughs> the Hindus, eh? the Hindus believe that when you reincarnate, your rebirth, you have your rebirth, eh? yep. you carry your soul along. That's right. They call it transmigrate, eh? yep. right? Even the Christians believe in that. Yeah. So that means in Theravada Buddhism, we totally dispel that part of the idea. Eh? Yeah. 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 No. That means. Yeah. But there's there's some uh, there's. Okay, maybe slightly different identity, but there's some connection, isn't it? That, there is, uh, that's, that's what I mean. It, 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 is a, it, it is a continuity without identity. Yeah? This is the difference. But if you look at that continuity, there is nothing essential that is always there. Yeah? There's, nothing, there's no essence, there's no thing you can finally point to which is always there, carries through all the way here. All of the things that are, it is, this, this, identi this uh, continuity is built up uh, are transient phenomena that actually can disappear completely, uh, come completely uh, and disappear. And so there's nothing there which actually is always present, if you know what I mean. Uh, that's the point. Yeah? This is the difference between the soul idea and the idea of continuity. Uh. Mm, okay. okay, thanks. Yeah, <laughs> and th this, is why, th this is precisely why you know, a lot of people find the idea of uh, uh, you know, Theravada Buddhism or Buddhism in general, early Buddhism if you like, so challenging because pr these kind of things are you know, hard for people to, to grasp. But this is really, this is kind of one of the essential things that make the Buddhist teaching exactly what it is. Uh. Yo, yeah. yeah. So, uh, just sharing a bit more on yeah. like physics viewpoint that can 
maybe help in this. Okay, go for it. Uh, yeah. Just recently, I read reading about the three roots to quantum gravity by Lee Smolin, and surprisingly, the way that he describes how physics describes the world seems very similar to what, what Buddhism says. Is in the in the Newtonian world view, view classical physics, what most of us learn in high school, we have we have things objects one objects two, then there's we can take out time. The object seems like eternal, and we can and put in the evolution equations, have time in, then see how they change. Uh -huh. So we have objects and then change. So there seems to be something that exists and change is an optional part. But as we go into modern physics, it seems that it's not logical or possible to take time out of the equations. There's no such thing as a thing or stuff. It's more like everything is process. Everything is just events happening. So instead of seeing a movie as a as an illusion that the real things are the films one by one, the pictures that happens like 60 frames per second. We usually think of the frames as the true things and the movie, the motion is an illusion. But actually the true thing is change is the true thing and the pictures are the illusions because even if you take a picture, those are just things that changes more slowly. So a statue, a chair, a table is just also still process, but just that they change more slowly, we think of them as more of a stuff. Then it's actually everything is just continually changing and process. There's no such thing as a thing and then DT, but there's a continuity, just, a, just as you said. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, good, yeah. Mm. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So this is uh, maybe yeah. another way to yeah. look at it. That seems a bit clearer, perhaps. Um, on to the question of the DN thirty nine. Okay, yeah. so we're going to DN twenty nine. Yeah. Okay, <laughs> um, so ac according to uh, uh, that, this was the question you asked yesterday, which I uh, uh, had a quick look at just before now, and uh, this is just I think an alternative way of looking at the ten <laughs> unanswered questions by the Buddha. So there is a sta was a s in ancient India, they had a standard set of ten questions that they would ask all the contemplatives and that they were supposed to answer. Uh, and these questions, does the Tathagata exist after death? Does it not exist after death? Does it both exist and not exist after death? <laughs> does it neither exist nor not exist? Does it neither exist nor not exist after death? Is the soul and the body, are they the same? The jiva and the body, are they the same? Are they different? Uh, uh, and uh, the other one is the universe infinite or not infinite? Is it eternal or not eternal? Those are the ten questions. I think I got that right. Uh, and uh, then, uh, the, the, then there is an alternative way of looking at these ten questions, and that was what this is really is, and that is what where the happiness. Uh, exists after that. Uh, is happiness is permanent, yeah? uh, whether it is not permanent, uh, whether it is neither permanent or permanent, whether it is both permanent or not permanent. Is that, is that right? Uh, yeah. So, and, and this is really just an alternative formulation of the same thing, of the same principle. Uh, uh, if happiness exists internally, basically that is a bit like the, the soul existing after death, because one of the most prominent and important aspects of the soul, the jiva, is the idea that it exists eternally, yeah? or that it is happy, I should say, sorry, that it's happy and exists eternally. Huh? If happiness does not exist eternally, huh? uh, you, s you, you know, you, you were arguing that that may be similar to the Buddhist point of view, but that's not really the point. The point here, this needs to be understood in terms of the philosophy of the time. That is the same thing as saying that the Tathagata does not exist after death. In other words, things stop when you die. That's really what it was referring, that, that is what this refers to. Not that feelings change, but that they exist as a self until the moment you die and then that it disappears, yeah? Just like the annihilationist view. So that is really just an annihilationist view, rather than being a view of, of feeling changing all, all the time. Uh. So that is really, I think, the only way to understand that, uh, because it, uh, you look at the questions, they are parallel to the ten unanswered questions. They are parallel to that, so I think you must understand them in the same way. Uh. So it's, I don't think it is the Buddhist point of view that is, that is made there. Uh. I think that's all there's to it, actually. It's not not all that uh, perhaps all that interesting, but uh, you happy with that? Uh, think n not really. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yes. 
Just as funny that usually we, when we experience pain, we have the mantra, these two shall pass. Yeah. And then the, that, uh, the Buddha said in the Sutta, pain is not eternal. I do not acknowledge that view. <laughs> yeah. it, pain is not eternal. Yeah. yeah. He, he does not acknowledge even that view. He doesn't acknowledge that view. Yeah, 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 yeah. 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 Well, I, I think the, I think funny. the point there is just that mm. you have to see it in terms of eternalism and annihilationism. That's really all it means. So per pain mm. is not eternal. Means that at death, you know, it's, it's not a even if a self wears a completely painful self, which would be quite terrible. Imagine you have a self that is completely painful. Uh, then when you die, it stops. That's what it means by not eternal, really. Uh, mm. So it, is, uh, it has to do with the uh, the. The idea of self, the self. Remember the point, the problem is that when uh, for an ordinary being, the idea is that there's always some kind of self there. And there's just different variations on the same theme. And there's two possibilities. And one is that that self truly is eternal, which means that you carry on after death. Uh, or uh, you you, when you die, the self disappears. Uh, and so that this is just a reference to that same principle, but in terms of feelings. Uh, yeah. And the additional of neither lives nor not lives, and both lives and or bo both exist and does not exist, it's kind of a philosophical addition. But the two main positions is annihilationism or eternalism. The two that really matter. Huh? Okay. Yeah. So another question is, uh, does going onto the path and wishing very hard to want to attain to enlightenment, uh, can, can it like, cause more bad karma to ripen uh, more often? To go onto the path of enlightenment. Yeah, yeah. I mean, to wish to fast track the path of enlightenment, might might it be uh, more karma wants to bad karma wants to ripen before we end existence? Uh, it it, sh it shouldn't shouldn't do that. It shouldn't it shouldn't it shouldn't. I don't think that is usually how how it would work. I think it's rather the other way around. Because remember, one of the principles of karma, the, the principle that is probably the most important one in terms of the practice, uh, is the idea that if you live well, you dilute your bad karma from the past. And of course, what you are doing by living the uh, living the holy life or the spiritual life to the maximum of your ability, you are diluting things to the maximum of your ability at the same time. Huh? So I would say it's the op other way around. You actually minimize the experience of, of, of a karma yeah, by living the spiritual life. Uh, and then eventually when you become a stream enter or an arahant, you actually uh, you, you destroy the ability for certain karma to ripen at all. Yeah? And it, any karma that's supposed to ripen in the future life is just wiped out and it can't happen anymore. Huh? So I would, I would say, it, it, I personally, I think it's the exact opposite. You don't actually cre create more bad. You actually, uh, yeah, no, you don't exactly. Uh, it, it's, 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 I think it says the other way around. The, 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 the bad karma gets diluted out, and you actually, it, things are better as a consequence. I hope so. Otherwise, I'm, you know, well, I'm not sure what I'm doing here. <laughs> so, <laughs> anyway, let's let's have a look at some of the questions in the in the box. Okay, dear Ajahn, uh, wonderful Sutta session, very much appreciative. I have, uh, have the best meta dream of my life last night. Wow, that's really nice having a meta dream. That is, that is, that is really excellent. So, okay, well done. Um, question, please advise in detail, step by step, how to maintain calmness instead of suppressing uh, sensual desire. Thank you. How to maintain, how to calm the sensual desire, presumably, instead of suppressing sensual desire. Well, don't worry too much about the sensual desire, because uh, the, the thing to really w uh, worry about, if you're going to worry at all, but I wouldn't even worry, I would just kind of deal with things. Uh, the, the thing to deal with uh, in uh, your life is really more upset and anger and these sort of things. This is what really matters, uh, and especially in lay existence. Of course, if you are a monastic, you have to deal with sensual desire, because as a monastic, you, you, you can't really allow sensuality to, to take over, because then you have a big problem. Uh, but for lay people, it doesn't matter that much. Focus on anger. Anger, the Buddha says, is vastly more to blame than sensuality. That is the big problem in life. That causes enormous <laughs> disharmony, causes so much bad karma, causes so much, uh, causes every, uh, you know, you regress on the path, you stop kind of moving forward, everything stops because of that. You block your meditation, everything else. Uh, so focus on anger instead of focusing on sensuality. Uh. And the way to 
focus on anger. I'm going to talk more about that during the meditation uh, retreat part of this that comes up next f uh, four days, uh, not tomorrow, but starting on Tuesday, uh, Monday. And uh, the way to deal with that is just to learn to look at people in a slightly different way. Uh, learn to understand, use your wisdom faculty rather than the willpower. Don't suppress, but calm it down by using wisdom. Uh, learn to see, as I was saying before, the good qualities in people around you. And there often there are lots of good qualities, uh, but we tend to emphasize the bad qualities too much. We tend to be too fault-finding, uh, and this creates all kinds of problems. Uh, so look at the good qualities in other people. And by doing that, and also by forgiving the bad ones, uh, remember that people uh, are often, uh, they are you know, often suffering, so having more compassion, for example, is a very important part of this as, as well. Uh, and as you do that, you can overcome the, uh, the anger and negativity. I'll talk more about that later on. Uh, as for sensuality, uh, what I would recommend is just to remember how impermanent everything in life actually is. Uh, yeah, when I talk, part of sensuality is just our attachment to all the objects in our life. This is probably often the most important part. Uh, so just remember how everything in your life is impermanent, is so unreliable. Yeah, and start instead of having a refuge in those things that are impermanent, uh, instead of attaching to them, instead of expecting your house to still be there. Well, you know, do you expect to, when you go back tonight, do you expect your apartment to still, or house to still be there? Huh? You do, right? Uh, and if it isn't there, you'll be very disappointed. Uh. But what if it isn't there? What if it's gone? What if it's wiped off the surface of the planet? What if a burglar has burgled your house? Uh, you can never be sure. Uh, yeah, things are always unreliable. Uh. In Perth, in Australia, because the bushfire danger is so great, sometimes people actually do come back home and the house literally is gone. It's a smoke left. And people, it's terrible. People grieve and they cry and everything in my life is gone. My house, all my possessions, it's very uh, distressing when that sort of thing happens. Uh, but it is uncertain. It is unreliable. You just don't know what's going to happen next. So you should never, and this is why you stop, and this is one of the ways of counteracting uh, this um, uh, the whole sensual world, in a sense, uh, not finding a refuge there, not uh, taking it as given that this will carry on and this will actually be there for you in the future. Uh, yeah, this is one way of dealing with sensuality, which doesn't really get to the core of it, uh, but you start to see the danger in the world uh, and you start to look for a refuge within instead. Uh, look for in meditation practice for your refuge. Uh, look in your spiritual life for refuge, uh, because the external world is unreliable. Then you are on the right track. Yeah. Okay, so I hope that uh, helps a little bit. Uh, Okay. Okay, next one. Dear Arjan, what advice would you give to a young man who spends most of their waking hours playing computer games? <laughs> what does computer games do to a, men to a person's uh, mental state? Uh, 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 yes. <laughs> what advice would you do to uh, someone who spends most of the time, hours playing computer games? Um, I, I, I think what, what you have to do is that you have to somehow waken up people's natural wisdom. One of the, I think the wrong way of dealing with this is try to force them to change and try to say this is wrong. Maybe sometimes you have to force a little bit because it takes completely over, uh, over their life. But uh, it depends also on the age of the person, yeah, how old they are when they're very young. Then a little bit of kind of more firmness is required. But when they reach a certain age, you can't really use force anymore because they are supposed to know better. So sometimes you just have to try to, uh, I suppose, uh, <laughs> gently, remi you know, gently remind them that life has more meaning than <laughs> computer games. Yeah, that the hopefully life has more meaning than computer games. Maybe it doesn't. Maybe it's kind of the matrix is true, and then you have a you know the computer game or the computer simulation is all there is. Uh, but um, so you have to be very. Uh, you have 
people really have to find that inside themselves to understand uh, the limitations of computer games. Uh, and once they start to understand that themselves, then they are able to overcome the addiction to these things. It's like smoking cigarettes. Uh, smoking cigarettes are very, very addictive uh, and very hard to give up. Unless the motivation is coming from within, you won't be able to give up the cigarettes. You have to see the harm, you have to see the problem uh, that these things actually uh, give rise to, and then you can overcome the addi addiction to cigarettes. Otherwise, you just keep on going back to it again and again, re-establishing that addiction uh, inside of yourself. Uh, so, um, uh, again, you have to kind of uh, make sure that the person you know, finds a greater meaning in life, a greater purpose in life. They understand that uh, this is never going to be really fulfilling in the long run. If you spend your whole life playing computer games, how will you feel when you die, when you pass away? You're not going to be very happy with your life. It's going to seem like a wasted opportunity. And gradually, maybe in this way, you have to kind of awaken, awaken their own wisdom inside. And eventually, they will move away from these things. But uh, it is not easy. Yeah? People get addicted to all kinds of things uh, and it is not easy to, to do this in the right way. Uh. What does it do to a person's mental state? Uh, I guess it depends on what kind of games they play. Uh. Yeah, if you play games that are very, very violent or whatever, it may have a negative effect on the mental state. Uh. I think a lot of the time it may, may not be necessarily so bad if the games aren't too violent or too bad or whatever. Some people say that computer games can make you more intelligent, as some people say, because you get very alert, yeah, very kind of interactive, very, very much so it kind of sharpens your wits or whatever. Maybe it does, uh, I don't know. Uh, uh, but in the end, you don't find any meaning there. You start to realize you are addicted to something. Uh, you can't live with that without it. You are bound to it. Yeah? You are bound to this thing. Yeah? You are dependent on it for your happiness. That's what addiction really is. Uh, and that dependency, after a while, you start to understand that this actually is uh, dangerous. Uh, what happens when I can't have it anymore? What happens when I die? And all these things. Uh, that's when it becomes scary. Suddenly you can't have it anymore. Uh, but you are addicted to it. Uh, that's problematic. Uh, so it is not nice to be dependent on something else for your happiness uh, because you feel that you're not in charge of your own life. Something external is in charge of your, your life. And then gradually you start to, hopefully, you start to understand with your own wisdom that there is a problem there. Yeah. Okay. So this is the um, uh, quote from Majjhima 85, pleasure is not to be gained through pleasure, pleasure is to be gained, no, it's, it's the other way around. <laughs> it's uh, pleasure is not to be gained through pain. Uh, uh, okay. Right, so this is the quote from the, I see, from the, from the, from the prince who gets it the wrong way. Yeah. What, is your, what is your insight into these? What, what's direct knowledge? When, uh, when knowledge, thoughts, insight arise, uh, never known before, uh, could these be signs of awakening? Uh, okay. Mm. Sorry? Pleasure is not to be gained through pleasure. What is your insight into these? Uh, um, well, uh, the, the point is, with this particular thing, yeah, the point is that um, uh, the prince, he was just saying uh, what was the common understanding in ancient India, which was that pleasure uh, is to be gained through pain. That's why they did all these ascetic practices, because by doing painful things, you would eventually liberate yourself through doing painful things. Yeah? Somehow get rid of the body and then uh, uh, enlighten the mind as a consequence. Uh, so that was kind of the ancient idea in, in India. And then the Buddha comes along and he rejects that. Uh, and this is precisely what we have seen in the Arya Pariyasana Sutta and the Mahasachaka Sutta, where the Buddha goes through the same, or the Buddha to be goes through the same problems. He realizes it's a dead end. You can't actually get there through that. Uh, and so he rejects the whole idea that through creating pain in the body, or, or uh, in, in whatever way, that can lead to awakening. No, it's the other way around. You need the happiness 
happiness of the mind, the happiness that comes from piti and sukha and pasadi and all that, and only then is awakening possible. Happiness is what leads to even more profound happiness. This is, this is what the Buddha says. Yeah? So this is... Uh, uh, is that what you mean? Um, okay, so what, what is your insight into this? So this is the insight of the Buddha that he actually has in, in that sutta. Uh, what is direct knowledge? Uh, direct knowledge is when you see something. Uh, it, it's abhinya is the Pali word that is often translated as direct knowledge. Uh, and it means insight. That's really what it means. Uh, it means the understanding that comes from seeing things directly for yourself. Uh, so you can argue, for example, that getting a jhana state is a kind of abhinya, because then you have a direct insight into a samadhi experience. You know what the world is like when you abandon the sensual realm 100%. You've never seen this before. Yeah, so it's kind of a revolutionary when you see this happening the first time. It's like, whoa, now this is what it's like. And, it, and, and of course, it is extremely good. It's a very, very positive experience. There's sometimes they call it a positive trauma. That's quite nice, isn't it? Most traumas are negative and you can't get them out of your mind. And this trauma is positive. It's so nice you can't get it out of your mind. Yeah, this is kind of what samadhi does to you. So direct knowledge is all about these things. It's all about all the things when you see things for yourself, but especially insights, the insights into impermanence. Suffering and non-self. That is what. That, these are the real insights and the things that um, uh, stay with you uh, until the end and take you out of samsara for good. Uh, this is the, these are the real things. Uh. When knowledge, thoughts and insights arise, never known before, uh, could these be signs of awakening? Uh, um, yes, there could be signs of awakening, but uh, the path is uh, a long one, and it's sometimes it is hard to know whether it is just a preliminary insight. Sometimes we have small insights, and it may seem that we never had them before. Maybe we never had them before in this life, but maybe we had them before in a past life. We just can't tell sometimes. Uh, so sometimes it, it depends. And very often it's very common for people to think that they have reached a state of awakening when they actually haven't. Uh, yeah, you get a partial insight into something, uh, like you get a deep samadhi experience and you are blown out of your mind because it's so powerful. Uh, it doesn't mean that you are enlightened, but some people take samadhi to be awakening, even in Buddhist circles. It's quite common because the experiences are so powerful, because they feel like non-self, they feel like sublime happiness, they feel like everything, they think it's awakening. Uh, so uh, it depends. It, it, yes, experiences you never had before could be awakening, but most of the time they're not. Uh, most of the time there are some kind of lesser insight into reality. Huh? Okay, last question for today here. Dear Ajahn Brahmali, listening to the Dharma class, one's doubt and one's doubt, clears one's doubt and strengthens one's view. Is there any reason why we at times feel sleepy and attentive when the Dhamma talk is in progress? <laughs> oh, you are sleepy when I'm talking. That is very bad. That is terrible. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I appreciate the comments and views, Sadhu. Well, it's just, it's just the nature of the mind. Yeah? Sometimes you feel sleepy. It's just the, it's just the way things are. You, you cannot be attentive all the time. And uh, if you were, it would be, would be a, like a small miracle if you were always attentive. I, I would be very impressed with you if that was the case. It's just that the mind goes through cycles. And uh, uh, you can, exp you know, after the meal, many of you look a bit groggy after the meal. I feel a bit groggy myself sometimes. And it's just... The nature of things, yeah, I can't really avoid that. So don't worry about that. You are more than welcome to uh, even to snooze off. I'm not going to tell you off if you start snoozing a little bit. It's okay. You can do that. Just go with the flow. Don't try to force yourself to be awake just because you, uh, you know, just because you feel that you have to be awake or anything like that. You don't have to be awake. Yeah, it's perfectly okay to rest a little bit. And very often we overexert our minds and because you overexert your mind you feel sleepy yeah you will work long hours work and work and work and then when you come come back home 
you feel completely out of it, uh, and that is kind of natural. Uh, and these are quite long days here as well. Uh, this is kind of the the hardest kind of dhamma sessions that Bobby has ever put me through personally, uh, kind of with so many hours. Uh, but it's also enjoyable. I don't mind it so much. Just if only for three days, it's it's okay, uh, and it's nice to get these things kind of together like that. Uh. So uh, don't worry about it. The most uh, uh, important thing is that you get something out of it, uh, that you keep on practicing the path, uh, and then when you come back next time, uh, you will feel less sleepy. Yeah, because you're practicing the right way, you ha have more attention, you have even more interest, uh, and the defilements will be declining in the mind, so you have more attention next time around. Uh. So, uh, yeah, that is my comment. <laughs> okay, any more questions from anyone? Uh, anyone like to? Uh, to say anything, ask anything else? Uh, everyone, every, or is everyone too sleepy already? Uh, okay, please, uh, please. Yeah. Um, Ajahn, yesterday after going through your suttas and all, I went back and see my kids' yeah. Dhamma books. <laughs> 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 I just couldn't help it. Yeah. <laughs> so there's yeah. a lot of discrepancies. So for one, um, this. AN 3.39. Yeah. It states that uh, it occurred to me that uh, an uninstructed whirling and all this thing, yeah. it occurred to yeah. him. Yeah. Um, is there another sutta that states that he went out of the palace with his horse Chunda? Uh, Kan no, with his. Uh, uh, yeah. Kantaka. Yeah, yeah. So does that sutta. But which one precedes which? He went out of the palace or it occurred there, to there him? There is no such sutta. That's the thing. There's no, There's no such sutta. The, <laughs> the place where the, this story with Kantaka occurs is not part of the sutta. It's part of the origin of the Jataka collection. That's where you find it. If you go to the Jataka collection, is all, these are all the past lives of the Buddha collected into one uh, sequence, and these are mostly legend and mythology. They're not real suttas, not the word of the Buddha. And that collection has an introduction to it, a long introduction, 150 pages or whatever, that talks about the life of the Buddha. But it's not early Buddhism. It's not comes and come from the Buddha. Nobody knows where it comes from. Uh, so it's unreliable. Uh, the reliable part is in the suttas, because that is the word of the Buddha. That's why I'm focusing on this. Uh, so the story about Kantaka and all of that uh, is just, uh, I wouldn't worry too much about it. Uh. It's in their books. <laughs> <laughs> well, th this is the thing. You know, they, are, they are going to have to learn themselves to differentiate th between those things that are nice Buddhist stories uh, and those things that are uh, real Buddhist teachings. Yeah. So the part whereby they state, um, there's one part, it says that from the first week of his enlightenment up to the seventh week, every week he did something. So mm. that came from the Jataka also. No, that does not come from the Jataka. That comes from the Udana. I the Udana see. is a is a s small book of verse, and the first few uh, chapters there are on what happened to the Buddha after his awakening. It's also found in the Vinaya Pitaka. This okay. is how authentic is that? That is probably a little bit more authentic because it's found in the Udana, but but probably not a hundred percent authentic either. Yeah. Also more uncertain. Yeah. So chronologically. Yeah. Yeah. Where do we start? Start, start with the four Nikayas. Uh. Yeah, four <laughs> Nikayas is a place to go. Uh. So long discourses, mid-length discourses, connected discourses, numerical discourses. This is the word of the Buddha. The other things, uh, you know, you don't have to dismiss it. You don't have to. They are nice stories. Uh. Yeah, the people like stories as well. It's okay. Uh. Just remember <laughs> not to take it too literally. Uh. Okay, because yeah. it, it doesn't feel right after attending your sutta classes. Yep. <laughs> 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 yeah. Okay. So that, that, that's yeah. what I, I wanted to just, ask. just tell your kids, uh, yeah, tell, tell your children that uh, uh, when you tell them that, remember these are stories. Uh, this is not the literal truth. Uh, yeah? There are so many stories in the world. We read, we read our children's stories all, all the time. Yeah? Or stories from, I don't know, whatever they are, you know, uh, uh, you know Arabian Nights or whatever they are, <laughs> or, or, or they are these kind of stories. But st human culture is full of stories. Uh, and these are an important part of our culture. Every culture has stories in them. Uh, and we read those and we enjoy those for what they are. Buddhism too has its stories. Uh, 
And it's okay to read those. There is some truth to those stories. They're not entirely made up. If you look at the one with the Kantaka, there are aspects in that story there which are taken from the early suttas, which are probably likely to be correct. But there are also aspects that have been added later on. So just tell your children, well, this is a story. Some of it is true. Don't take it too literally. Just enjoy it. Yeah. This is the way to, so, and then they learn to think about these things in a, in a good way. They learn to think about it with a mind which is a bit more inquisitive rather than kind of grasping onto things as 100% right. Uh. I see. Okay, there's this one last one. Yeah. Um, it states in their book, um, Buddha's first converts. Uh, uh, this, this merchant called Tapa. Tapas. Tap, yeah. Tap, yeah, and Balika. Huh? Yeah. yeah, is yeah. that true? Is that in the <laughs> <laughs> That is also from the Udana, the one I mentioned before. I see. And uh, so it is. Uh, uh, maybe I'm not sure. Maybe is it true? Maybe true? Maybe not? I'm not sure. In, in the suttas, the first uh, person who met the Buddha seems to be this. Upaka, did, were you here today for the? Yes, yeah? yes, Upaka yes. seems to be the free, but he, did, he didn't become a convert, yeah? so he doesn't really count. Uh, <laughs> so he, he lost the opportunity. So is that story true? It's very hard to say. I wouldn't take it too literally myself because uh, uh, it is found that part of the Udana. They are, I, I can, there are many studies on these things. There is a stu the Udana has been studied in detail. It, it exists in Pali language, it exists also in Chinese translation, the Udana. You do a comparative study and many of these things do not overlap. They don't have anything in common with each other. Okay. So because of that, you, I tend to be a little bit skeptical. I, I'm not s dismissing everything out of hand. I'm just kind of saying, you know, uncertain, unreliable, don't know. It doesn't matter so much. So okay. take it as a nice story, huh? but don't take it too seriously. Huh? No, because it's just the word convert, because uh, Ajahn Brahm always says that Buddhist, Buddha, don't, we don't convert. Right. Yeah, yeah, so then there is such a word, so... It's just the way the translator has translated it. Uh, what okay. it means, they are, what it says, actually, I have translated this myself, because I have translated the whole Vinaya Pitika from Pali to English, and that story is also in the Pali Pitika. Like, what it says is that these were the first people to take refuge in the Buddha Dhamma Sangha, or not in the Buddha Dhamma Sangha, because Sangha didn't exist yet, in the Buddha Dhamma. Yeah, okay. the, they took the twofold refuge in the Buddha Dhamma. So that's the better. So that's all word. it means. That's all it says. And then the translator you have has somehow translated it as convert, but doesn't say anything about convert in there. Yeah. So okay. the translation is also can also be <laughs> a bit dodgy. There are many complications, right? Yes. <laughs> it makes it very hard. Yes, yes. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Very good. Uh, yes, please. Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, Ajahn, um, the coming days during the meditation retreat, uh, would Ajahn be able to um, include in the uh, some meta meditation yeah, and sure. how to go about it? Yeah, of course. Yeah, mm -hmm. okay. absolutely. Thank you. Yeah. And. Um, uh, Maybe because of health issues, okay, yeah. I find that um, it's different, the sittings now are different from before. Yeah. Um, you know, it's like uh, sleepiness, it's more of tiredness, but the mind is conscious. Yeah. Yeah, so, um, but the body is tired. Okay. Yeah, so um, I, I understand of the, um, uh, as per regards of the five, hindrances, mm -hmm. okay, but this is more of, um, I mean, if the body gets tired, it would hinder the progress. You can't really see it as really seeing it because you are seeing yeah. your tightness and you're seeing yeah. your breath most of the time. So how to actually, you know, it's like um, uh, overcome this state of body tightness. Okay. Yeah. Mm. Sometimes the body tiredness can be overcome by simply by not paying attention to it and just going to the meditation object. It's possible to be very ill, it's possible to do all kinds of things with the mind even though the body is tired. So the body does not necessarily have to be a hindrance for your meditation practice. It can be, but it doesn't have to be. Sometimes you can just f try to forget the body, just make it comfortable, make it as easy as you possibly can. Yeah, even though it is may not be 100% comfortable. Uh, and then see if you can just follow the meditation object without worrying too much about the, uh, about the body. Uh, that is, I think, one of the... Uh, yeah, okay. <laughs> carry on, carry on. It's so interesting. 
Yeah, okay. So this is, this is the, starting, uh, the starting point. But uh, the, one of the problems with the body is that you can only do so much with it. Uh, yeah? And if the body is ill, if the body has problems, uh, you, can only, you can only do what you can do. You, and you have to just make sure you look after it, uh, that you have a sense of uh, kindness to yourself. And if necessary, uh, take an extra rest in the middle of the day. Don't feel that like you have to come for every talk. Yeah? You can, you can uh, go and have a, have a nap somewhere, sleep, and uh, whatever, whatever else it is, uh, so that you can relax and you can rest the body so the body is more at ease. Uh, so look after yourself. And uh, one of the ways of doing that is to make sure you have enough metta for yourself. Uh, when you have more metta for yourself, you don't push yourself too hard. Uh, and when you don't push yourself too hard, you allow the body to rest more. So the mental attitude is actually very significant again. Uh, the mental attitude is always significant. It's always the thing that ultimately allows you to rest properly and to go, go deeper. Uh, yeah. Fully agree. Because um, with sufficient rest uh, of the body, yeah. then um, you know, it's, it's, it's fantastic. Mm. But, um, I mean, I would really, really love to actually, uh, like what Ajahn said, you know, it's like the body is tired, but we can, um, the first part of it, I don't really get it. Mm. Uh, the, the first option. Okay, you don't get it. Yeah, no, yeah. I don't understand. Okay, it just, uh, it's just like um, you, uh, it's just about forgetting about the body and focusing fully on the mind, yeah? which can be very difficult. And it's difficult because you haven't, haven't perhaps developed the mind yet to be able to do that. But uh, you can withdraw attention completely from the body uh, and then go to the mind instead. You can, help, you can use the breath a little bit to do that. Uh, but if you uh, it can give rise to joy and happiness, for example, quite uh, quickly, then the body fades into the background very, very fast. Uh, and then you kind of stay with the mind instead. Uh, and that's really what that means. It means that you just leave the body to one side, you let it be, and then you, uh, you, you go, you use the mind, p power of the mind instead. Yes, the consciousness yeah. knows the breath, yeah. But the body is like, you know, it's like, so it's, it's fading behind. Yeah. Okay, so that means um, here, watch the breath in and out, okay, and, and, and you are like, you know, you know, with knowing. Yeah. So is that what Ajahn means? Yeah, yeah, something like that. Yeah, whatever. You w the more you withdraw from the body like that, uh, the better it is. So st yeah, stay with the breath. Uh, leave the body in the background, uh, and as you do that, you can you often you're able to just uh, you know to uh, uh, forget about the body altogether, and then uh, suddenly the body is gone, and you are so happy because the body is gone. Yeah, all the problems are have disappeared as a consequence. Correct, but there is a difference still with the body being having enough rest and not enough rest. Yeah. Because with the body having enough rest, we get to see more. Yeah. So with the body is being tired, then you know, yeah. it's like, um, look, I love meditation. Yeah, okay, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I love meditation yeah. and yeah. I find that health is so important. Yeah. I didn't really knew that last time, okay. Of course, yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah, so, um, Paying the price now, okay. Yeah. So, um, how do I, you know, it's like, yeah. uh, because I, I, f I find that um, perhaps it's mm. the attachment of wanting to carry on to see further and not seeing the other part of it, of not having the body but the consciousness seeing the breath. Yeah. Correct? Uh, yes, I, that I think so, yeah. yeah. To a coin. yeah. There are two different experiences here. Yeah. yeah. Is that what I mean? So, uh, so you're saying that to be aware of the breath without focusing on the body, is that what, it, what you're saying? Or, or okay. Um, yeah. When the body is, 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 is not tired, yeah. okay, um, it's a different paradigm altogether. Yeah. But when the body yeah. is tired and the, and the mind just look at the, the consciousness, just look at the breath, yeah. it's another entire paradigm right. altogether. Um, it's not that different because the, the body is just in various states of disrepair. I mean, the, even when the body is healthy, still it can be in, it's a nuisance sometimes, yeah, because it has pains and it, it has all kinds of things. Uh, so it's just degrees of problems with the body. It's always going to be problematic to some extent. Uh, so I don't. I wouldn't say it's a different paradigm. It's just a different degrees, different s different ends of the scale. Yeah, one end of the scale, the body is less problem. Other one, it's a really bad problem. Uh. So of course, if the, if you are on the 
bad scale of things, it is more important to withdraw into yourself more quickly and to get rid of the body more quickly because it is more problematic. So you want to, uh, if you can, just go to the breath and then become peaceful very fast and allow the body to fade away, that is ideal. One thing you can do in your situation is to do meditation lying down. Yeah? If, the body is, uh, if the body feels bad, lie on your back, lie on a surface that is not too soft but just right and do meditation lying down because then the body is actually resting while you're doing your meditation practice. Yes, I do that. Yeah. Um, means like on my uh, back, you know, it's like yeah. I even while and like when I sleep, I know that I'm breathing. Yeah. Yeah. So, so yeah, um, I do that as well. Good. Yeah. It, yeah. Does it work? Yes. yes. But but the thing okay. is that um, when I sit meditation, that yeah. is where I notice that um, oh the body is tired, so it goes to you know it's like um, it knows the consciousness knows the breath, but it's not yeah. like. Uh, it's, it's a different kind of experience as when the body is recharged. Yeah, sure, yeah, uh, yeah, Def absolutely, I know, I know what you mean. Huh? And uh, so you just have to experiment, yeah, do some lying down meditation, experiment a little bit, see if you can uh, maybe lie down first, so to kind of to gain a degree of mindfulness, a degree of sharpness, uh, yeah. and then once the sharpness is there, then you can sit up and you can try to go with the experience. Uh, yeah. Try to experiment a little bit like that and see how you, if you can actually get the, uh, get the thing going. Yeah? And once it gets going, then it's much easier. Uh, okay. Hard part is getting started often. Uh, yeah. This just a hiccup, yeah. It's okay. Yeah? Thank S you. So see, <laughs> see what happens. <laughs> okay, I think enough. Yeah? <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Okay, let us pay respect to the Buddha Dhamma Sangha before we uh, go off. Sunday school here. Yeah, we use this hall for Sunday school. Oh, okay.